Hey guys, welcome to the Challenge Podcast. I'm Coach Steve. And I'm Coach Nick. And we're going to be talking about everything fitness, health, and the challenge. Let's get on with the show. What's up, guys? Coach Steve here, and welcome back to another episode of the Challenge Weekly Show. Today, I'm joined with our co-host, Coach Nick. Nick, how are you doing today? I'm really good, thanks, Coach Steve. Episode 81. I know, Nick. Episode 81. We're only 19 away from the big 100. And oh, gosh, I don't know what we're going to do when we get to that 100. I I think when you, you hype something up so much, once you get there, you're kind of like, ah, what, what do we do now? Right? So mm. uh, I, I don't know if we build up to the 100 or if it just arrives and we're like, hey, Nick, we're at 100. Hey, this is kind of cool. I'm not yeah. sure how we, we approach this. And then we wrap it out. And that's our new working podcast weight. That's right. Yeah. Once you move to the triple digits, it's, it's, you know, yeah. you're 101, 102, and you move mm-hmm. on, on and on and on. It's very similar to your approach to fitness, right? Like once you reach a certain benchmark, a threshold, you, you, that's, that's, that's become the, the new baseline and you've mm-hmm. got to, got to go beyond that. Right. Yeah. Um, so challenge weekly show episode number 81. Now, Nick, this week is an exciting week. Like always we're in week nine. So we just started the final phase of this very first M challenge. Mm-hmm. Now, the final phase does see a further reduction in calories if you're losing weight, a further increase in calories if you're trying to gain weight, um, and a change to your training plan, so that last phase. Now, this is kind of that time where, quote, you know, the magic happens, where we, you know, put in that that hard work built on uh, the foundation that we put in of of habits and routines and behaviors. And, you know, this is where it does get uh, challenging, but because we're full of motivation in the last couple of weeks, it's it's physically the most challenging time, but mentally like the 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 most achievable time. So mixed together, it's less difficult than the middle phase. So if you've made it through that second phase of the challenge, weeks five to eight, and you're now in the tail end of the challenge, weeks nine to twelve, congratulations, you now pass the, the hardest part. And even though this final phase might be, uh, you know, in a way more challenging physically, uh, mentally it's more achievable and we can roll into week 12 and get excited for these amazing results. So we've put uh, big and long, uh, hard efforts into to, to achieve. Yeah, the finish line is in sight. So I'm very excited for everybody. And um, we're still here to support you all the time. So just pop us a question on the forum or anything that you want because we're here the whole way, aren't we? The whole way to the very end mm-hmm. now it was an exciting weekend last weekend we had many of you complete your uh, phase two check-in photo um, and upload those photos to social media so we saw that on places like facebook instagram um, and a few people posting about it on the forum as well so big congratulations to everybody who has uploaded their phase two check-in photo um, there is no real like closing time for the phase two check-in photo you have up until the end of the challenge to upload that phase two check-in uh, so if you haven't done it yet no stress um, you know you can do it today you can do it tomorrow uh, but make sure you get it done. And that's just a, a bit of like a selfie, a little bit of a check-in. Um, a great great way to replicate that start photo. So if you've replicated uh, your start photo, the phase one photo, and the phase two photo, it could be a great time to compare those three photos and a great time, again, to reflect on your journey because you might get to this point and you go, well, gosh, I haven't, I haven't seen any significant change. And you take a moment, you sit down and you reflect and you go, well, uh, like, you know, week four, I went on holiday. Week five was really stressful at work. Week six, you know, my kids got sick and, you know, I haven't really done my steps and, you know, I haven't really been that that adherent to the nutrition plan. Um, and we go, well, okay, you, you could have put a little bit more effort in. So this last phase could be a great time to reflect and go, well, yeah, if I get all my dominoes in line, I can knock them down and roll into week 12 with this amazing result. So it's all about reflections and that's all it is about reflections in the last four weeks if you need any help or assistance, like Nick said, we're always here to help. Yeah, reflections and responsibility. So take personal Ooh. responsibility for everything. Ooh, R&R. Mm-hmm. R&R. In, the, in the opposite way to what you're not going to R&R right now. You're going to R&R the way that we say. <laughs> R&R with the other one at the end. Yes, yes. A bit of a, what is it, rest and recovery is it R&R? Is that... Yeah, I yeah. think it's rest and recovery or rest and relax or rest and, relax. rest yeah. and relaxation. Something I'd, I've got no idea about. <laughs> whatever, whatever R's you're into. Maybe you're a pirate. Maybe you're an R. R. Uh, that's, that's up to you. Rum, rum. rum. Oh, yeah. No, I don't think I really yeah. want rum. No. It's not that exciting, but no, anyway, no. They like rum. Now, Nick, um, I have a few pet peeves. Okay, I have a few pet peeves, and most of it is around the use of language. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and I see it in the physical world. 
Uh, I see it in the fitness world. I see it in the, uh, you know, physical therapy, osteopathic kind of world. Uh, you know, words are powerful and language is powerful. And the words that we choose to use have certain ingrained meaning to it, right? And the, the best use of language is, you know, the your internal dialogue that you have. Um, and an example could be the, the words you choose to use around your, let's say, hunger. Okay, um, you know, there's a whole spectrum of words you can use to describe your hunger. And you could say you're hungry, you could say you're starving, you could say you're ravished, you could say you're, you know, so hungry you can eat a horse. <laughs> um, and then maybe on the other side, you could be like, oh, I'm a little bit peckish, or like, oh, I'll nibble on something. Um, or, you know, I'm not, I'm not that hungry, but, I, you know, I'll, I'll have a bite. And they all have different meanings to it. And how you choose to describe your hunger often has um, a, an action associated with that. So if you often describe yourself as being hungry as, oh, I'm so famished, oh, my God, I'm starving, every time you go to sit down and have a meal, you will eat like you are starving, regardless of how you sit on the hunger spectrum, okay? Mm. Now, we see it in um, the clinic uh, where people come in and they would describe their symptoms or their pain or their experience with pain. And they would say things like, oh, it's 10 out of 10 pain. It's agony. It's such an ache. Like, oh, I'm so like, you know, bedridden and use these really strong and powerful words. And even how they describe their body, it's like, oh, you know, my disc is slipped or my, you know, it's bone on bone or, you know, the really strong words, which aren't often the case. Now, in my time in the challenge, um, I have had a few uh, back and forths with individuals um, on social medias, online, um, in places like the forum and such of uh, talking about the use of language that we choose. And um, firstly, I want to say that I don't mean it out of um, any sort of malicious intent if anything i mean it as a a reflective process okay now um you know some of those conversations might be around you know very dogmatic words dogmatic meaning that there's uh, there's only one way to do it you know there's the, the my way or the highway type thing and you see this often in um experienced individuals or people who um a little bit of the dunning kruger effect where they've done a little bit of reading maybe watching a few um youtube channels or influencers or whatever and they go oh well this is the way to do it and if you don't do it this way um it's going to be really bad um and you know that's not often the case often we see improvements or movements towards our goals in a range of different th different ways right even down to nutritional approaches you know you can pick any diet in the world and you'll find someone who is, follows that diet and has achieved amazing results and that's everything from low carb to low fat to vegan to carnivore to you know like any other type of weird and wacky uh diets out there you'll find somebody who um has had success in that and we take that step back further and look at the principle of it and we go well they were able to lose weight because they were following an energy deficit or a calorie restriction and they achieved that through a strategy um so this is just my gentle reminder to be cautious of our language and using very dogmatic phrases and opinions, um, especially when they may be more harmful or pose a nocebic effect, meaning that um, a, a negative stimulus from, from nothing, um, especially when you're online, because that goes out to lots of people. And if you start saying that, you know, I don't know, deadlifts are bad or your metabolism is going to bottom out or, you know, you are going to hurt yourself or you're going to wreck your hormones or whatever it is, like that might not be the case. And especially if you say that and then offer like a strategy that's really weird and wacky, like, oh yeah, you will um, mess up your hormones unless you have a detox. It's like, well, hold on, what does that even mean? Um, you know, how are you measuring that? How are you quantifying that? You know, where's your evidence that can support that? And that can lead to more harmful behaviors than positive behaviors, okay? Uh, so just a gentle reminder to everybody out there, just uh, be cautious and if, uh, you know, myself or Nick or someone else pops up in the woodwork to question you on your language. Um, I, I don't mean it maliciously. I mean it out of love, I mean it out of respect. Um, and I mean it out, out of a, a, a growth area for all of us because we all grow, right? And I don't know, I don't have the answers to everything all the time, um, but you know, I'm always there to learn. So if you say something re really weird and wacky, I would love for you to explain it to me. Um, and I'm willing to accept that I'm wrong. And I hope that you're willing to accept, uh, accept if you are incorrect um, and use it as a growth, as, as a way of growing. Definitely. And also remember, if you're posting something online, an answer to something, then you have to be ready to be questioned as well. And that's the same goes with us. You know, it's the same for us. 
you can question us and we can question you. It's to do with anything. It can be to do with scale weight. It can be to do with anything. Uh, once you put it out there, you're kind of allowing a dialogue to start. Yeah. And that dialogue doesn't need to be bad. You know, it's not like, again, it's not a, it's not a malicious thing. Um, I, I want to learn as much as you do. So, uh, yeah, me explain, too. explain it to me. I'd love to, love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. hundred percent. Nick, let's move on to our next segment here. We've got the community highlight where we highlight some of the members of our community. So Nick, take us away. Who would you like to highlight this week? Okay. So Angie V, how are you going, Angie? You're looking really great. So Angie B, Angie V has um, a throwback Thursday as a community highlight. She says, 12 months since I rejoined the challenge from the 1st of the 9th, 2021 to the 1st of the 9th, 2022. I'm 12.5 kilos down and loving life. I'm still a work in progress, but enjoying the ride. Never give up because you can do anything you put your mind to. So that's a, that's a long journey, you know, 12 point five kilos done in in a really um really good way in terms of just over a year um you know building muscle as as well you know as in revealing the muscle um not going ham with it and yeah well done angie you yeah, good that's a that's an amazing transformation mm. uh, especially when you're looking at it from the big picture right 12 12 months mm. and and 12 kilos and you know looking at photos of Angie, she does look very lean as it is. So 12 kilos yeah. is probably a very large percentage of her body weight. So keep it up, Angie, you're doing a great job. Um, and, and I believe she is competing soon, maybe? I think she wants yeah. to, um, yes, I, I don't know much, but I know that, that it's on the cards for Angie. So yay, yay bring it on, sister. Yeah. No, that's so awesome, keep mm -hmm. it up. All right, so the next one is Chantal Trower, and she says, eight-week progress. This challenge, I felt like the changes have been much less subtle than my first challenge in 2020, and the scales have only moved down 2.5 kilos. Fortunately, I think she means much more subtle, but anyway. Fortunately, when I feel a bit defeated, I look at my progress photos and can see changes in the right direction. Bring on the last four weeks. So that's fantastic. Chantal's got different measures to um, have a look at how she's changing, um, which is fantastic. I like the idea of approaching change with lots of different units of measurement or ways of looking at it. So um, not just focusing on one thing. Well done, Chantel. Yeah, that's that's awesome, Chantel. And if you are listening to this, Chantel, I would recommend that you look at your scale weight changes in terms of percentages of your body weight rather than the actual kilos lost. So if we were doing re some really, really quick math, not to take away from the community highlight, two and a half kilos, divide that by eight is, you know, what, around like 300 grams lost per week. Um, and if you weighed, let's say for argument's sake, 75 kilos and you lost 300 grams per week, um, you know, you could be looking at around that like 0.5 percent ish um, of your body weight per week, which is what we recommend in weight loss, right? Um, so you might be nailing your weight loss in terms of percentage weight loss per week. Um, but if you're kind of caught up on the number of the weight loss as opposed to the percentage, um, of course, you're going to be feeling a little bit deflated, especially when you might see some other, let's say, bigger guys out there who might have lost 10 kilos so far and they started at 140 kilos uh, percentage wise you might be the exact same thing even though the number lost might be very different yeah another way to look at it as well is literally to look at it and think like if you're little um it's going to look very different on you than if it's somebody huge and they've lost 2.5 kilos you know 2.5 kilos can look very very different when mm -hmm. you lose that yeah. so well yeah. done Chantel, and thank you for bringing it up and we love it so the next one is Jody McTaggart. So Jody, she uh, is doing a throwback Thursday to my running and cardio days. It was all about being lean and body weight um, and the number on the scales. So I'd just like to point out, um, maybe not really lean, maybe just being skinny because there's a difference. Anyway, that was just my own two cents. I'm definitely enjoying the stronger life and building my body. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes the scales and weight get in my head, but I'm feeling great where I'm at, enjoying the journey. And I'm learning that scale weight is only a number and doesn't define us. We are all on different journeys and whatever your journey is, follow your goals and dreams and you'll get there. So there's about 10 kilos difference in the photos. And Jodie definitely looks like she lifts weights now, as opposed to being a, um, 
just a runner, which is fantastic. If you're a runner, that's great. You don't want to carry the heavy muscle around. If you're a distance runner, that's just like carrying 20 water bottles on your back. <laughs> so, yeah, Jody, well done. Well done, Jody. No, yeah, uh, watching Jody's transformation over the past, uh, I would say, a good 12 months or so, similar to Angie, you know, working working hard, and I know that she'd likely be listening to this podcast. Um, and I just want to say, Jody, I've been watching your uh, training videos, especially things like your hack squat. I do think you can go a little bit deeper, but yeah. I like how you are improving and going lower and lower, and I'm sure that your legs are feeling it as you increase that range of motion, keep it up. Definitely. Um, yeah, Coach Steve would cut a hole into the centre of the earth and make you go that deep. <laughs> so don't don't get stressed about it. It's it's all about depth. It is, it is. Yep. All right, I've got a few uh, that I'd like to highlight, Nick. The first one goes to Dimitros Deske. And uh, Dimitros writes, um, week eight check-in complete with a little bit of a tick. And he, of course, he put his uh, week eight check-in photo up. And he writes, I've hesitated putting up this picture in the past, although now I'm really finding confidence within myself. And it's all thanks to this challenge. I'm loving, I'm giving this my all four weeks ago. Let's get it. I like that. It's simple. It's uh, inspiring. And yeah, I think many of us are, are, are a similar spot where we might, you know, be sitting on the fence, watching the shadows, which is cool, which is fine. Um, but, you know, as you start to get involved in that community, make yourself seen, people see you, um, you know, you kind of pledge yourself to the higher authority, whatever that that is. Um, and, you know, you can really start to see these great transformations. So, uh, Dimitros, I'm going to invite you to stay active over the next four weeks lean on our community, and I'm sure you are um, on track for an amazing result in week 12. Absolutely. Well done, Dimitros. And um, I love the way that you're just, you, you're just poking your head out and feeling the environment, and now you're just going to put pictures up all the time, right? That's what yeah, we want. That's what we want. Mm -hmm. Next one goes out to Mitchell Trent, and Mitchell writes, uh, week eight check-in. A similar one, he posted a before and after. And he, he also writes, I've been doing body scans to track my progress. As of this morning, I'm down 10.4 kilos in weight, and I've put on 7.2 kilos of muscle and, and have dropped a total of 9.6 body fat. Still a, lo a long way to go, but I'm feeling great and loving being back in the gym. I like this uh, for a few reasons. One, um, you know, using other metrics such as like a body scan. There are some uh, challenges and limitations with body scans, regardless of which method you use, whether it be the um, BIA analysis or a DEXA scan or a BOD pod or whatever it is. Um, and they often have their own um, error rates, especially when measuring things like body fat and muscle mass. Um, so hearing those numbers like 10.4 kilos in weight loss plus 7.2 kilos in muscle, uh, like I, I, I hope that that is correct. Um, however, they are quite extreme and unlikely, but Mitchell, looking at your before and afters here so far, you're doing an amazing result, regardless of what the numbers say. So, so keep it up um, and keep putting in that good work. And we're excited to see what you can do over the next four weeks. Definitely, definitely. Absolutely. Sounds good. Go, Mitchell. Go, Mitchell. The last one here goes out to Maddie Walker. And Maddie writes, Hi, guys. So this challenge has been a little different for me, working hard in the shallow sh shadows rather than parading my progress to everybody. I've been working so hard and am happy with my progress so far. I started this challenge seven weeks postpartum, so I'm currently 15 weeks post having my third baby and officially down 22 kilos from my final pregnancy weight eight kilos during the challenge so far. I still have a long way to go, but I'm excited to reach my goals by December. I can't wait to, can't wait to smash the last four weeks and hope everyone is well and reaching their own goals. I like this one, Nick, because Maddie, very similar to Dimitros, where, you know, in the shadows, getting getting the work done, putting in the efforts is making some significant changes. And as um, a, a kind of new dad myself, um, my boy's Birthday is uh, you know next week, so I'm almost one year into being a dad, and another one along the way in November. I can understand the challenges of having newborns, and especially if you are third baby, and um, you know just 15 weeks postpartum. Probably a few uh, late nights happening right here for Maddie. So keep up the good work, keep getting the the, the steps in, the food in, look after the kids, and we're excited to see what you could do by the end of this challenge and by December. 
Yeah, good on you and good on you for finding a minute to to post it as well because you'll inspire other people just by sharing that. There are so many people and I think with the, the postpartum community, you know, people that have had babies, sometimes you just go, oh, what's going on and is everything ever going to go back to normal? So it's really nice to um, have that kind of inspiration and have someone share it. So thank you for sharing. No, so good. Mm. Nick, let's move on to our next segment here. We have the Coach's Corner, where we offer our tip for the week. So, Mm -hmm. Nick, take us away. What advice do you have for us? I'm just going to talk a little bit about the fear of failure, simply because, um, as we all know, I'm coming up to a competition. And, of course, these are things that I will think about as well. So I'm reflecting on myself. It's sort of... Uh, very, very pertinent to me. So I figured if I'm thinking about it, there'd be other people that sometimes come across this as well. So it's worth having a little bit of a chat. So I want you to ask yourself, are you constantly approaching things, but with a fear of failing? And secondly, are you worried about making mistakes? And what do mistakes look like for you? Now, um, I'm sure that you know, Coach Steve, because this is your favorite stuff, but Failure, you can look at it as first attempt in learning. So that's what fail stands for. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, so it's quite good. But, yeah, fear of failure can actually be worse than the actual failure itself, whatever you perceive it to be. So um, it can kind of really hold us back. Um, Like I'll just share, you know, someone said to me uh, actually just today, they go, oh, you could possibly you know, they actually said really nicely, you could, and it's not just a random, you could win your class. And I, I'm like, oh, no, I couldn't. No, no, I couldn't. That's not what I'm. And I was thinking, why am I having that dialogue to myself? How can I overcome that? So then I just thought of some ideas. So my favorite thing in the whole wide world being Italian is to um, look at the worst case scenario and work backward from there. So I think that that's a really good way to Uh, approach the idea of failing something because if you look at the worst case scenario just say you did not accomplish what you set out to accomplish what would actually happen would the world end would anyone care work backward from there and then you can kind of see that it's not as bad as what you think Um, it's the fear of the unknown so say for me if I stood up there and I came last or I didn't even, if they said to me, get off the stage, the next class would walk on and life would go on and I'd share it with you in the podcast and we'd make a story about it. That's the worst thing that could happen. So um, the other thing is to, once you've done that, flip it on its head and think more positively because you might have heard this and look, I know that people say it all the time and all the gurus and everything, but you can actually think things into existence You can actually seriously think things into existence. So um, positive thinking is like a really powerful way to build the self-confidence and neutralize that sort of self-sabotage because you might not even know that you're doing it. Say you might get to a certain level in your life and it's comfortable and you actually do quite well and you don't necessarily even need to go any further. That's usually where people stop. So how do you get past that? That's that's a very interesting thing. So I think it's really important to visualize, visualize yourself being successful and keep doing it every single day, every single day, even write it down and just see how your thought patterns change to become that person. And the other thing is, Make yourself a little Italian backup plan as well. Have a contingency plan. So if that doesn't work out for you, you can always flip it and do something else as well. So how does this relate to the challenge? Just to bring it back in, we have got our final four weeks. We've got, this is the time where really you can make or break. So if you want to get super ultra lean, you've got to picture yourself being super ultra lean and you've got to do the things that a super ultra lean person would do every single day, every single minute. And the fear of failure can be, you can have it later on, but you've just got to do the work now. So I really, really, really think that if anyone's listening and they are sabotaging themselves, I think that you need to do a little bit of self-work and really like lean into what where whatever it is that sort of might um hurt you in a way where you you get a bit scared and that's the bit where you need to explore 
And I'll tell you, every single person that's ever been successful has failed heaps as well. So first attempt in learning. I want to hear from anyone. I want you to write down if you listen to this and if there are any tips or tricks that you have to move forward and past this, because I bet you, Coach Steve, you failed many times before you became a successful coach of the M Challenge. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Uh, I think my biggest tip around like dealing with maybe it's failure maybe it's like that kind of tall poppy syndrome like can i actually achieve this thing you know that kind of like self-doubt is um to to practice a bit of stoicism right and that might be a little bit of reading into like the that kind of uh philosophy but you know it's this kind of like um existential like nihilism that like hey one day we're gonna die right that's the only thing that we can know for certain um and one day you know the world is gonna keep on going without you and that's kind of okay as well like if you fail like i think fewer people really care about it right it's mm. really just it's really just yourself um and you know if you do fail like you know I, if anything it's something to be excited about like when i fail a lift when i fail a, a job when I, if i fail a task whatever it is um you know i know where my limit is and you bet that i'm going to keep on working at that until i become better at that um so i think it is a little bit of like accepting that that is just the way of life getting the work done and you know as you get do the work every day um you get slowly closer to closer to it and if you aren't failing you don't know if you're actually growing right if you just do the things that you know how to do or do the things that are like you find comfortable like that's not like that oscillating like growth it's just where you are like if you go and like go to the gym and train and it's easy like you're not growing if you are you know going and and, and doing something like going for a run or trying to be at your peak performance and it's not challenging you're not growing if you are going to go and become like i don't know a a chess grandmaster and you're just playing primary that's school you. that's me if you're just going to go play primary school students all day and you know whoop their butt like are you getting better like no you got to go play people that are that are better and fail and lose so that you can get better at it so it's exactly the same thing when it comes to what we're trying to do here in the challenge we're trying to build muscle we're trying to lose body fat and improve our body composition uh and, and it's hard work it's not easy it's not easy Nick. no and yeah like my final tip is also just to publicly state what you're doing because um it kind of it dulls out like a like cordial it sort of dulls out the fear of failure a little bit because um you kind of when you when you speak it, it it's okay people are actually really accepting a lot of people would say i can't believe you're even doing that you know let alone anything else so um yeah everybody just keep going you're doing really well self-talk <laughs> no i like it nick I would like to talk about getting swole by stretching. Oh, okay. Let's do it. Getting swole by stretching. And I say, I want to talk about this because uh, in the social media world that I'm in around um, the evidence-based community, there's lots of uh, discussion around this new research paper that came out. And I think it's important to discuss it because what tends to happen in the evidence-based world and within fitness is it's very trendy. What's on trend, you know, what's, what's in fashion. And mm. what would happen is maybe a scientist will come out being like, Hey, this is the research that we've made a science communicator in the next level down. Someone who's a lot more intelligent than I am would read that paper, convert it into like, you know, a, a catchy bit of content. Great. And then as a little bit of a bit of a game of Chinese whispers, you know, one person would set to create content around it. One person would create content, one person would create content and then by the time you consume that content online it would be a complete bastardization of what it originally was so i want to talk about it now okay before you kind of see it in your uh instagram facebook feeds okay i've so, already seen it you've so already I'm seen it damn okay no, so yeah um it started uh, without talking about where, where it started from we'll talk about the actual study okay and mm -hmm. it was a study which was one of the first studies to provide evidence that um a that stretching provides a hypertrophy signal, improves strength, and of course, improves flexibility. So, um, you know, in the past, we think that, you know, you stretching a muscle 
it does not stimulate any sort of hypertrophy response like muscle growth or any strength response. Um, you know, it doesn't, doesn't do much other than changing the central nervous system um, around that muscle, okay? Meaning that we can get it to a longer um, position because of the way that the goggly tendon organ, the GTO and the muscle spindle work, okay? Um, so if you want a little bit of a rabbit hole, you can go Google muscle spindle and GTO if you want to learn about how muscles kind of contract and relax and all that stuff, okay? So what this first study did, right? And the title of it, if you want to go and look it up, it's called the Influence of Long Lasting Static Stretching on Maximal Strength, Muscle Thickness and Flexibility. And that's by Wanaki et al. Now, this study had 52 participants and they were athletes. So these were people who were um, lifters themselves, you know, quite fit individuals um, around the mid twenties. So, you know, young, healthy people, and they were randomly assigned to two groups. Okay, so RCT style, right? Random control trial. Um, what they did was they put an orthotic on their foot, right? Which stretched the foot into dorsiflexion, right? So just how you stretch your calves, okay? Mm -hmm. And that was set to a pain scale of eight out of 10, okay? So you stretch, stretch until you reach a pain level of eight out of 10, 10 out of 10 being like the worst possible pain imaginable, one being, you know, nothing. So it's quite a significant stretch that they're placing on the calf. They then had the individuals wear that orthotic boot type thing um, for one hour. Okay, so they're wearing this boot for an hour at a pain level of an eight out of 10 um, for six weeks. Okay, so pretty uh, intense like thing, right? And what they found was that after the trial, so after six weeks of stretching for one hour, hour a day on the calf um, at a high level, they saw an increase in isometric strength, right? So not the concentric, or the isometric, like uh, kind of when you do a plank in an isometric position mm -hmm. in the calf, so isometric strength, flexibility in the ankle and the calf, as you'd expect, and then increased muscle size. And that's measured by a, a thickness. Um, I think it was an ultrasound they used. And that was about 15% ish across all three aspects. So quite significant, which was pretty cool. So um, what this then means is that all the folk who were very pro stretch, hey, you got to stretch every day came out and were like, this is great. You know, you just need to stretch every day and you'll be able to gain muscle. Um, however, one, you've got to stretch for a long time. Right. Mm. Imagine you, you, you're going to train your hamstrings and you stretch your hamstrings for an hour a day at an eight out of 10. OK, who has time to hold a stretch for an hour? Right. Um, and then you compare that to the whole body. So, all right, you're going to stretch your calves for an hour, your hamstrings for an hour, your glutes for an hour. You might as well put yourself on one of those medieval stretch racks and try mm. to stretch your body um, for a whole hour. OK, so it's a little bit interesting where we go. We can't really apply it that much. Right. But it has an interesting connotations where we know that in the hypertrophy world, building muscle, muscle tension is what drives a hypertrophy. So creating a tension on the muscle, and that's usually via a stretch and contract kind of model. So this study, which stretched the hand, stretched the calves, further adds to this concept of tension, where muscle grows primarily through providing tension. And this tension was provided through a stretch tension, kind of like an elastic band, you stretch it and there's, there's mm -hmm. a, a tension on the elastic band. And we do the same thing when we're lifting weights, you know, we're applying tension because there's a load, we're trying to contract against it. So it's imagine like you're trying to pull that elastic band rather than stretch the elastic band, a similar kind of idea. Now, there's a, a second study that came out not too long ago, which has a little bit more applicability. And this um, is something that I'm going to start, I guess, recommending to individuals as adding to their training, which I don't think is um, takes away from training, is an easy, has easy applicability to training and provides some sort of benefit. Okay, so mm -hmm. this study, this study is called loaded interset stretch may selectively enhance muscular adaptations of the plantar flexors. Okay. And this is by Van Every et al. Okay. Mm -hmm. This one had 25 participants, so a little bit lower. They were non-athletes, so people who don't train, but they were recreational. And it was called a within participants design. So what they did was they had 25 people. One leg was the control leg and one leg was the experimental leg. So they did this experiment on one of their legs, right? Well, the other one was just the test to compare. Mm right yeah. what they did was calf raises so they did um four sets of 12 uh, 8 to 12 to failure and then they rested for two minutes okay then one of their legs either right or left for the leg for the study were assigned to a 20 second loaded stretch during their rest okay so what does this look like you do calf raises once you do your set to car of calf raises to failure you then hold the stretch at the end for 20 seconds is what they 
used it for. And they did this for an eight week period. And when they compared like their left to their right leg or right to the left leg, depending on which one they did the entire study on, um, there was an increase in isometric strength, similar to the first study, flexibility and muscle size, much lower, about 5% or so. So mm -hmm. what does this mean? Is that in this small study, which is um, you know just breaking through into this kind of newish world of like stretch uh, mediated hypertrophy, which is a growing body of literature, where we go, well, if you wanna maximally grow your muscle, an interesting way to intensify it is to add a stretch after you complete your set, mm. okay? That can be a loaded stretch. So like, let's say you're doing calf raises. Once you complete your set of calf raises, maybe you've got the machine calf raise kind of thing. You've got the load on your shoulders, you're doing calf raises. Once you've completed the set, you hold the stretch for you know, five, 10, 15, 20 seconds, as long as you can hold it for, right? You'll feel the burn. Um, I trained this morning, tested it out on a tricep extension. So I was in my garage. I have a little bit of a cable pulley type situation. I was doing tricep extensions. Um, and then once I um, reached an overload stimulus close to two reps, close to failure, I held the tricep stretch. So, you know, my forearms were against my bicep under load tricep stretch. And I could only hold it for about five seconds before I, I had to give up. So the, just the stretch and the burn was quite intense on my triceps. And normally it takes me about three sets. I pretty, feel a pretty juicy pump and only took me two sets. I was like, this is nice. This is cool. I like this. So as an applicable thing you can add to your training today is one, we should be training at a full range of motion to elicit a stretch while we're training. So to Jody with your hack squat, go down deep, stretch the quadricep at the bottom. If you're doing bicep curls, I know one of our ambassadors, Maria Kasheri, has jumped on the arm blaster and posted a video on our Facebook social hub. And again, you know, needs to straighten the arm to stretch the bicep. You know, as we get better at stretching our muscles while we're training, then if we added a loaded stretch straight afterwards, and that could be with the load that you're using. Or if it's just not applicable, like let's say the bicep, you're doing bicep curls, you can't really stretch the bicep with your arm straight. You need to kind of get your arm behind you. So what you might do is do bicep curls. And then once you finish your bicep curls, you know, go to a position, maybe on a chair or a bench or a wall or something, get your arms behind you and stretch your biceps. That would uh, increase the metabolites, increase the, the tension. And, you know, this study suggests that we can see significant um, muscle growth muscle strength and flexibility over this kind of longer, you know, eight week period. Okay. So main takeaway here for my coach's corner is that when you see this stretch stuff on social medias, um, firstly, it's not the Holy grail because there are some limitations, you know, you're gonna be stretching for a long period of time, but if we add it into the bigger picture of what we're doing right now, adding a stretch, you can see a benefit in between sets. Okay. Um, and we, and it could be something that you add into your training today. Um, that doesn't mean that you need to stretch for longer times. Like, you know, if you uh, finish your session and you want to go home, great. Like, you know, you going and doing a cool down stretch or something like that isn't going to add like a significant thing unless you're going to be holding it for like an hour, right? Um, but the interset stretching can be beneficial because we're combining the tension that we're placing on the muscle in the training with, an, with a stretch immediately afterwards. Mm. that is where the magic happens. Not so much like if you train in the morning and then you do like a half an hour stretch at home, that might not be the same output. Okay. So growing, growing area of stretch mediated, stretch mediated hypertrophy, focus on feeling that stretch when you're training um, and you will reap the benefits of a, a juicy pump and some serious gains, Nick. Interesting. You heard it here. Sort not, of first. Not first, but uh, <laughs> yeah. as I'm, I'm part of the Chinese whispers, Nick. I, I am I'm not intelligent enough to be able to be the, the pure science communicator, even though I read science quite often, read research papers, and I've got my master's degree. I, re I wrote a paper. You can see my uh, published work if you Google my name. Um, but there are some far more intelligent people, especially when they go into the statistics world of, of um, power and all this stuff, um, a little bit outside of my, my pay scale, I reckon. Mm, well, I reckon it sounds pretty good. I'm going to try it with calves because I need all the help I can get. So oh, yeah. let's bring it on. Let's bring it on. Nick, mm. let's go into our final segment here. We've got our question and answer. Okay, first question comes from Lee. Mm. A little bit of a longer one. It has been shortened already. But Lee writes, hi, coaches. 
Hi Lee, how you doing? You're right. The last four weeks, my calorie intake has been 1,787, and I have really started to struggle with the side effects such as sleepiness, fatigue, anxiety, and moodiness. I know that these are expected side effects of calorie restrictions. My concern is that my calorie intake is due to drop to just over 1,600 calories on Monday, and this is going to be way too low for me to maintain. So my question is, should I just stick to this path, which is be, which is based Based on my starting weight and activity level, or should I re-input my data as my current weight and increased activity uh, too high? Um, this has, this will no doubt increase my calorie intake. Which will this halt my progress? Which direction should I go? Thanks, uh, Nick. Lots to unpack here. Lots. What Lots. would you, what advice would you give? to Lee, um, who's yeah, struggling a little bit with the calorie intake and he's set mm -hmm. to reduce his calorie even calories even further, what should he do? Well, firstly, good forward planning, Lee. I like that. And um, that also shows me that you've been really adhering to it because um, otherwise you wouldn't be so specific with it all. Um, well, I'll just point out also the language that I'm hearing. Um, you could kind of change that language a little bit because it is a diet. Let's just say that. But um, the first thing I would say to anybody is if it's working, don't mess with it. So you are losing weight. Um, you don't have to drop your calories more. If you did a check-in with me and I saw that you were, you were losing weight um, and it was working for you. So, you know, 0.5 to 1% of your body weight um, per week. Well, why would I change that? That would be actually silly because there's no interventions whatsoever needed. Um, I think you could probably um, maybe like rather than set your, I don't know, I, I can't remember if he said he's got his weight loss um, set to a specific thing. Um, yeah, but it probably had rapid because everybody's choosing rapid. So I'd probably just um, put that little counter a little bit more towards the middle and um, or keep the calories at the 1787 because that's working for you. Um, it is fair that you're going to feel a few things, but also I would suggest that you kind of detach yourself from how you're meant to feel with a specific number because I think that that sometimes also can influence the way that you do feel. You are going to feel pretty shit if you want to get pretty lean in the last four or so weeks, but, yeah, you don't need to do anything too extreme. I think that... Um, or you, you should probably either keep your calories the, where they are rather than um, going to the 1600 or um, yeah, the other option is if you did drop it, you could see how that goes. But I just don't think based on what you've said, I don't think you need to do anything. I would just keep going. I'd go for another week and have a, have a look at what's happening to you. Yeah, I, hmm. I, I agree. Um, like you said, Nick, if, Lee, if you were losing weight at a rate of 0.5 to 1% per week, great. That strategy is working. Keep it up. If your weight loss is lower than 0.5 to 1% per week, then um, you would want to see that, that change either in calories, reduction in calories, or an increase in your physical activity level. Um, but, you know, as, as Nick often says, you don't want to play all your cards at once. Like if you mm -hmm. reduce your calories now, uh, what we tend to find is this, this slow like adaptation occurs where you know your metabolic rate will slowly, slowly decrease um and if you don't need to reduce your calories you don't have to right if you are successfully losing weight at this calorie intake um you know some other magic number isn't needed like you could stay where you are that's the that strategy is working okay um now often in the challenge we we have this set uh decrease over four weeks um so that we can help the vast large number of challenges who come and see us to lose weight or gain weight, whatever their goal is. Um, mm -hmm. And there are some individuals that stick just outside of that, um, th those kind of statistic numbers. So Lee might be similar where he may have chosen a rapid weight loss. He's losing weight really quickly. His calories are super low. He's experiencing diet fatigue and he might benefit, yeah, from maybe a moderate weight loss. Um, we're still losing weight, um, but, you know, consistently is, is better than getting so dug into diet fatigue that you ultimately give up on the diet right? Yeah. And the other thing is also just let me point out one more thing that I have to say, can't help it. But, um, it. Way too low for you to maintain. You're not meant to maintain a caloric deficit forever either. So don't forget that it's a get in, get out strategy. 
So um, just with that language, if we're going to unpack it, you, you won't need to maintain that. You need to just do it for that amount of time. So don't forget that as well. Yeah, mm. no, good, good. Next one here, Nick, comes from Rhonda. And this question was on our Facebook social hub. And Rhonda writes, I'm feeling a bit wobbly with my food and would love some advice, please. I have been on point with my nutrition and staying within my calories, 1,312. But the last couple of days, I feel like I need a day to eat whatever I want without counting calories just for one day. Should I give in and do this, then reset and refocus and keep going? Hashtag calorie counting. Okay, let's break it down, Rhonda. Um, actually, kind of a similar-ish question to Lee, where Rhonda mm. sounds like she's experiencing a little bit of diet fatigue, where you know it's becoming challenging, feeling a little bit, she uses words like wobbly with my food, and she wants to kind of have um, a, a day where she could eat whatever she likes. Okay, so again, talking about language, you know, these are kind of language along the lines of like a binge eating episode and having um, free reign or disinhibition to eat whatever you like um, often doesn't work out very well for us. Okay. Um, one, you know, we could can over consume calories. And even if we were to like double our calorie intake to 3000 calories over the course of a week, if you were eating, um, you know, 1500 calories every day for, for seven days, um, and then you had a day with a double. So you'd having eight days at, at 1500 calories. Um, what's my math here, you know, like 12,000 calories or so that you're consuming in the week. Mm -hmm. And if you average that out, you know, it might be a very small um, increase over the course of a week to your average calorie intake. So that's the first way we can look at our average calorie intake, where if you eat a little bit more, it could be okay. But from a behavioral point of view, when we often uh, go through the process of disinhibition, where you are dieting, you're inhibiting yourself from eating food, if you disinhibit yourself, you often kind of quote, go off the rails, right? Uh, you, don't, you don't have any control, it's not regulated, and you know you consume whatever you like. You often feel really crappy afterwards and it is really hard to refocus and get back on the line. So what I pose to Rhonda is a, a strategy that we call a diet break. Now, a mm -hmm. diet break, Again, language is important. It's not a cheat meal or a cheat day because that's, you know, it sounds like we're cheating ourselves. It's not like it's just an open ticket to whatever, eat whatever you like. What a diet break could represent is just a simple break from your diet where you increase your calories back to a predicted maintenance calories where, you know, the theory behind maintenance calories is that we are not losing weight or gaining weight. We're just keeping our weight um, steady. And you could do that through the M Challenge app by recalibrating your, your calorie intake um, and selecting maintenance instead of weight loss. So that will give you a calorie prescription. You still would be eating similar foods that you're currently eating. You'd be eating similar meals and eating at similar times, but those portions might be slightly bigger. So giving you uh, that little bit of energy to improve your, your mood and your adherence. Um, and then if you were following a diet break for one day, two days, up to three days, up to 72 hours, that could be enough to reset. So what I recommend Rhonda is be careful to not kind of go off the rails and eat whatever you like. I would recommend that you stick within the framework that we have, increasing your calories, um, but choosing to have similar foods and eating at similar times and not, you know, just running to your favorite fast food store um, or, you know, uh, turning to the drink or whatever your kryptonite is, um, because that could be very messy and uh, may cause more problems than it solves. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. I like that strategy. I think that that's good. And maybe by now it's already happened for Rhonda as well. That's right. Yes. So let us know how you go. Nick, the mm. next question here comes from Deanna and Deanna writes, just wondering what I'm doing wrong. I never seem to lose weight in my inner thighs. What can I do to change this, please? Nick, what advice would you give to Deanna? Well, Deanna, um, the language again, um, never, what am I doing wrong? You, there's no wrong or right. Um, and your body, unfortunately, isn't a computer. So it is not programmable in terms of where you're going to lose your body fat from. And you actually can't like a computer game kind of erase certain sections of yourself because you don't want them there. It doesn't work like that. So that's, um, I guess, this thing called spot reduction. And people, 
I, people do think that that can happen probably because it's been marketed in terms of do you want to lose weight from this area and things and of course the thing is when you do lose weight you do lose weight from all areas but some take a little bit longer and notoriously hormonally women are going to be heavier in the lower body simply because of giving birth and um you know being pregnant things like that you you're going to have um a specific amount of fat around that area because that's how we are designed so you just have to wait it out so you want to stick to your calorie deficit and you want to keep training um train with weight because they do help create shape for your legs um it's nothing to do with tone or anything like that's just a, you know when you build your leg muscles they can look really good and um also, sometimes I'll just say one more thing, which is sometimes when you can notice certain areas of yourself and they stand out a little bit more, it actually means that you're getting leaner because um, those little bits that are stubborn tend to stand out a little bit more than if if you're just kind of, um, you know, if you've got heaps of body fat everywhere. So I wouldn't worry. I think that it's happening for you. I think if you're losing weight in general, keep going. Um, and unfortunately, nobody has that magic ability to spot reduce. Um, the only way that you could probably do it is by surgery. And I don't suggest that at all. I think you just keep going and you're not doing anything wrong, Deanna. And thank you for asking because um, no question is a bad question and you're not doing anything wrong and you just keep going because the difference between this time and every other time is that you're not going to stop. And that's when you will eventually see what you are after. Yeah, I like that. My only question for Deanna is how are you measuring your weight loss in your inner thigh, right? You can like, just see it. Like to say, I never, yeah. I, I have never seen, I, I never seem to lose weight in my inner thigh. Mm -hmm. um, you know, eyeballing is one thing because if you look at yourself every single day, it's hard. Like I look at myself every day, Nick, you look at yourself every day and you're mm -hmm. like, well, are my arms getting bigger? Are my legs getting bigger? Like, am I, you know, uh, gaining muscle, losing weight? It's hard to kind of say this day-to-day -day change. You might look at photos even then. You squint your eyes, turn your head a little bit of game of like, you know, spot the difference. Um, so it's, it's really hard to measure the inner thigh. Like maybe if you're measuring the entire thigh, you got to tape measure out and be like, oh, then my thighs are, you know, this many centimeters in, in, in girth. Like I'm now getting smaller in my thighs, but to say the inner thigh is very difficult to measure. So maybe you are losing weight and you're just measuring it incorrectly, or maybe you're just not measuring and you're trying to look at photos where you are losing weight, but you just can't see it in those photos that you're taking for a variety of, of reasons. So Deanna, keep going. If you are losing weight um, on the scales, you're confidently losing weight. <laughs> um, and it might be simply down to genetic factors where you might be holding your body fat around your hips and thighs, which is very, very, very <laughs> common in women. And for guys, you know, where we're, we're uh, commonly hold our body fat around our midsection, which we kind of get this stereotypical truck driver look where we've got little arms and legs and a big pot belly, a really stereotypical look. And then women, that stereotypical look of that hourglass shape, um, again, just down to genetics and Deanna, that could be you. And also, you, you could be growing your adductors as well. Just saying. Yeah. Like maybe, um, you know, maybe your inner thigh muscles are growing and they look awesome, especially like if you're going to do a back pose at the pool or something, you know. <laughs> I don't know. But like I'm just saying, you know, there's so many, so many good things about thick thighs save lives. Thick thighs save lives. As long as you can crush those watermelon, that's where it's at. Can you do that? <laughs> I have never attempted to crush a watermelon, Nick. I reckon you actually could. No, don't. I'm going to bring one into the office. No, it's going to be messy. No, we don't need crushed watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, okay. last question here. Again, comes from Lee. And Lee writes, hi, coaches. I'm wondering if the rep ranges for the unilateral exercises are per side or total reps I've been doing per side. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Lee, I would say, firstly, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, if you choose to do per side um, or total. So if the rep range is, let's say 10 to 20 reps, reps. Um, if you choose to do 10 to 20 reps on your left leg and then 10 to 20 reps on the right leg, so maybe 15 reps, 15 reps, no dramas. Or if you choose to do like 10 reps on your left, 10 reps on your right, that's 20 reps, that's, that's fine as well. Whatever you choose to do, as long as you're consistent. Um, it has been written and designed so that you are doing it per side and you'll find some more information about that in the uh, training guidelines in the learn section of the app. Okay. Um, so we are recommending that you aim to use that rep range 
um, per per side, so left leg or or right leg. And again, um, it, it, it doesn't matter too much as long as you're consistent with it and you are, you know, getting close to to technical failure where you feel that they're burning the muscle and you you, you feel the failure, you see a, a change in your execution speed um, and if you're consistent on both sides. A little bit of a tip on unilateral exercises, I would recommend that you use the non-dominant side first, right? So if you know that, um, I don't know, your right leg is stronger than your left leg and you're going to be doing a set of Bulgarian split squats, right? Mm -hmm. I would recommend you do the left side, which is the less stronger side first, you know, while you're fresh. And then when you complete your first set uh, of that left side and you get ready for the, the right side, the right side is the stronger side um, so that it can match the same reps. Okay. Um, that'll be my little tip, especially if you, because you don't want to be doing, uh, you know, the right side, which is the stronger side and you bust out like 20 reps. You've got like a cardiovascular fatigue, a nervous system fatigue, and then you go onto the left side, which is weaker, and you only ever get 10 reps. And you're like, ah, well, I'm doing 20 reps on my strong side, 10 reps on my weaker side, and then it's going to exemplify the um, you know imbalance that you have, right? So I'd recommend doing that weaker side first. Are you doing split squats in your program at the moment? No, not at the moment. Mm, I yeah, am. You and are. And I'm sad. <laughs> I don't love them. I just don't. I don't know who does, but like the outcome of them is good. Mm. Yeah, I think everyone has a love hate relationship with any sort of um, split squat variation, whether it be a, a lunge or a, a true split squat or a Bulgarian split squat, you name it. Um, but Nick, I'm still uh, doing my just one day of legs day, right? Um, where I'm, I'm focusing a bit more on my upper body. So my, my legs day is just the, the big movements, you know, squat, deadlift, leg extension, leg curl, um, it fits in nicely. So, uh, yeah, gotta pump the guns. Like, do you look like a Dorito yet? No, no, not yet, but I've been enjoying some juicy chest, chest pumps. Back pumps, bicep pumps, tricep pumps, all the good stuff is what well, we, what we enjoy. You don't want to outgrow your t-shirt because we can't get you another one. No, so, no. You know, but, keep it real. But look, if I do outgrow my T-shirt and if you have made it this far into the podcast, a uh, very soft announcement is that we will be launching our uh, online merchandise store within uh, probably a couple of days of uh, announcing this podcast. So you can head on over to our online store and purchase yourself an M Challenge t-shirt, especially if you're getting um, swole or lean and you need new um, attire to wear in the gym, you can go check out our store and buy yourself a fresh, fresh new t-shirt. Yeah, what a great way to announce it. Yeah, at the end, just for our diehard, diehard fans who made it to the very end of this podcast. I know. So if you've made it to the end, let us know and um, <laughs> spread the word. Spread the word, yes. But more, mm -hmm. more information coming soon. Probably announced by the time this podcast goes live, I reckon. Yeah, I reckon Jody will be the first one. I reckon to... she will. I yeah. reckon she will. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, let's wrap it up there for episode number 81. If you enjoyed this episode, let us know and we'll catch you next week for episode number 82. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you like the show, share it with a friend. Or leave us a review on iTunes to spread the good word. See you next time.